everybody to the beautiful Corolla, North Carolina. Wow! Was not expecting that. Hold up, hold up. A giant formation of ospreys. The aircraft, not the bird. Well, welcome everybody to one of the last videos of this journey. Um, I hope that you're able to hear me on the end of that last video. If not, you probably heard a voiceover. But we were in Kildable Hills for a few days to ride out Tropical Storm Elsa. And we went uh, probably four days off the water, three, four days off the water, um, and pulled the boat up on the beach. And now we're heading north. We're up in Currituck Sound now in the Northern Outer Banks, going to the Pine Island Audubon Sanctuary for the day. And we'll be on further up the sound towards the Bells Island, Currituck area tomorrow. And we'll be crossing the border the day after that. We've got like three days left. Ah! It's exciting. I hope you will continue to stick around for this journey up the coast here. Thank you all so much for all the concerning and uh, thoughtful words you've been sharing about preparing for storms and overall encouragement so far. But continue on with this adventure for a little bit longer. Well, welcome everybody to the Pine Island Audubon Sanctuary. This is part of the North Carolina Audubon Society. And this place is pretty cool, pretty special to me because I'm actually a volunteer here. Really? Was this my most graceful docking job? No. Will it work? You bet it will. Shade feels amazing. And cold drinks. It's just soda, don't worry. Oh, this is a very familiar territory for me. That I've been volunteering here for almost a year now. Well, in the three months that I've been gone now. But this is a cool place. If you are ever up in the Northern Outer Banks, please come check out the nature trail at the Pine Island Audubon Sanctuary. And if you're lucky enough to and find an event here because the main area of the place here is not open to the public yet um, that it's a really cool place to come check out because this is actually a old hunting lodge area so the main lodge is actually still standing it's what where I'm sitting on a side porch of now is a hunting lodge that's over a hundred years old that they've now reconverted into an office and lodge space for bird researchers which I think is super cool and I'm gonna get to stay there tonight. Good morning. We are off to somewhere north of here. Not really. Let's get you straight. There we go. Alright. 
So, we are now leaving Pine Island here up in Kurtuk Sound, and we're going north on our third, third to last day towards Norfolk. Um, apologies for not sending too much video to you guys about Pine Island here. I always feel awkward at recording around people, um, but Pine Island, very cool, great place, beautiful place. Come check it out, and we'll go explore some more of Kurtuk Sound. Oh, well, good morning. Oh my goodness. It was all fun and games until the wind picked up at like 3.30 this morning. This is what we're dealing with right now. Better day on here. Yeah, that looks good though. Alright, so yeah. It's not even 6 30, we're already mostly packed up. But for how tired I am, I'm gonna be making some coffee. Not doing the full oatmeal, I don't feel like cleaning up that much. But I really want some hot coffee this morning. We're gonna do that. I was definitely not expecting these winds this early in the morning. That was gonna make for a much better morning. I already tell. I'm tired. Ugh. Well, we're gonna be getting a really early start to the day here. Look at us go. Hopefully, we're gonna be undocking here before seven o'clock. We... Anyway, we're here. We are waiting. I actually threw out my anchor, just the small one, just to kind of keep me in place from drifting. Um, because we are waiting for the what's the name of the bridge? The North Landing Bridge. That is what we were waiting. For. We are waiting on the North Landing Bridge for an opening at 11:30. Um, because I talked to Pre previously about bridges that. Oftentimes, bridges will either open on request or on a set schedule, and this is a pretty busy area. However, I did want to take this opportunity to kind of go back to our tides and water talk 
um, because I feel like that's been a big theme of this trip because I think it's something important for us to talk about. Basically from Oriental to here, um, heading towards Norfolk, is all been wind-driven tides. So the these areas are so far from an inlet that uh, the gravitational pull of the moon is not strong enough to pull out these waters. Um, and so, because of that, the wind, when it interacts with the top of the water, as you can probably feel this wind here, um, or hear this wind noise, that actually there's friction between the air and the water, which then basically pushes the water around. And that's how we get our wind-driven tides. So if we get a strong south wind, it's gonna push the water level up um, for the northern areas. And then if we get a north wind, it's gonna push all the water to the south. Um, and so then at that point, it's nice that you don't have to worry about timing the tides. You just end up the timing, timing the wind, wind a little bit more. However, that's going to change as we go up to Norfolk here. And the reason we're not getting a tide here, even though we're, you know, less than 10 miles, well, 20 miles from Norfolk here, um, which has about a three and a half foot tide swing. The reason we're not getting it here is because there is a lock between here and there. And for those that don't know what a lock is, there's not a ton of them here on the East Coast, um, but they're very common down along the Gulf Coast. Um, and the, I think some of the best examples of them are the Panama Canal um, heading across uh, Central America. Um, that it's basically a, a small elevator system. So, so for a simple lock is you have a one channel that you have a boat go in, they close the doors, and then they lower the water to the water level on the other side so that you're basically able to maintain two different water levels. Um, and that can be done for a variety of reasons, um, whether you're trying to go over an area, so like the Panama Canal, um, or main, trying to maintain a water level. So I've seen locks to get in and out of marinas. Um, and then this lock here. Um, and this is actually the, the uh, Great Bridge Lock, I think is what it's called, um, is the only major lock along the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway. Now, if you've been watching the rest of my videos, um, I've actually already been through one lock uh, down at Windmill Harbor Marina at uh, Hilton Head Island, which they've got a lock system to maintain the water level inside the marina, which is really great for storm surges and for keeping critters out and so that they don't have to do floating docks, all those good things. Um, so this is actually my second lock of the trip. Entirely too much fun. <laughs> North Landing Bridge, this is Northbound Sailing Kayak. Time and tide, I'm clear. Thank you very much. If I've learned anything over the last, you know, two, almost three years and over three months on the water now, it's that we're not as divided as I think we are. So the current book I'm listening to on Audible. It's called Climate Courage by Andrea uh, Kreas. I apologize for butchering that pronunciation. The whole book is talking about a lot of what this is, of, you know, how do we solve climate change beyond the science? Climate science has been in agreement for decades now. Our society is anything but. And it really comes down to just talking about it. Not informing, but discussing that what we need to do is do the hard thing of open up and be vulnerable because that's the hardest part, I think. It's the activation energy of starting the conversation is the hardest part. Once you're in it, I feel like people would be a lot easier talking about it, but people are so hesitant to, you know, just breach the topic. And, and I'm guilty of it as well. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. I don't think there's much other option. We have to talk about it. You know, even if we might not agree at the start and we probably won't agree at the end. But by talking about it kind of puts it closer to the forefront of our minds when we're not talking about it. Prompting a question here might lead to an answer later that you're completely unattached to. But you know, someone learned something in there or was curious or wanted to learn more then starting that question can make the difference.
You want a garage for your yacht? That's pretty sweet. These are some really nice boats in here. Let's see how much they charge me. If they charge me at all. Wow, this is fancy. Preparations to leave the dock for the technically second to last time because we are going to leave the boat at Waterside Marina tonight and we'll get it out of the water smart but nonetheless <clears throat> last full pack up so we've got two major I don't want to say hurdles but like steps before we can get into Norfolk first we have the great bridge to get through which that is one of the bridges that has a set a schedule um, and is every hour so you want to make sure you time that one well. We are hopefully going to make it at the 10 o'clock opening. It's currently 9.32, so we're making good time. And it's literally just around the corner here. Um, and then we have to go then through the Great Bridge Lock, which is very exciting. We talked about that yesterday, I think. But um, we're gonna be going through that. That opens on, you know, as needed, um, but it, I assume it probably goes with the bridge opening. Um, so I'm looking forward to going through a big lock which would be cool. Uh, and then we'll get back on our way. High tides at noon. Should be able to ride the outgoing tide all the way up towards downtown Norfolk. Well, people are gonna be a pain here that don't really understand how this boat works, that yes, under Coast Guard regulations, you cannot have sails up when going through bridges. However, the sail is attached to the mast here and so I'm gonna furl it and take it down because this bridge tender is being difficult. Morning, Lock. I would like to come through on your next opening, please. Roger, just ease it this way. Once the case are in, we'll cut a green light on, proceed in, take it over on your forward side, need a bow line, star liners, please have a side for you to tie up to. Copy that, thank you. I think that I'm about to get this entire lock to myself. <laughs> So in our last video on the water here, which is weird to say, but nonetheless, for our last bit here on the water, um, the one last topic I want to talk about that's been kind of alluded to during this video of talking about um, how the tides are a little bit weird up in you know northern North Carolina area um, with wind-driven tides um, rather than moon-driven tides. But that also 
a factor, a part of that is also talking about salinity. So how much salt is in the water, because that drastically affects what kind of plants and animals live in those areas. So, you know, the ocean is salt water, and then the rivers coming down from the mainland um, is fresh water. So then we have this mixing of salt water and fresh water, and so we get this other term of water that is kind of a loose term of brackish water, which is water that is any mix of fresh and salt, which means that it could be anywhere from zero PPT, which is, stands for parts per thousand, um, well, technically one part per thousand, up to what ocean water is typically 35 parts per thousand. Um, now, in general, most brackish water sits around 20 parts per thousand, um, about halfway between the two. Um, but it depends on how close to an inlet you are. So, in the case of Northern North Carolina, when we get up into Albemarle Sound, and then further, even further up into Current Duck Sound, Current Duck Sound is almost fresh water. It's like one part per thousand, because there is no inlet anywhere near there. The closest inlet is Oregon Inlet, which is 40 miles plus south. Um, and there's so much water between where Kirtuk Sound is and where Oregon Inlet is, the salt doesn't have the ability to make it up to that area, which means that you get a completely different biodiversity of animals, particularly when it comes to the kinds of fish, the kinds of shellfish, as well as the kinds of birds um, that up in Kirtuk Sound, you get tons of waterfowl that love to come to that area to eat the sea grasses, not even really sea grasses, the grasses. That's kind of unique to think about that not only are our tides affected by where we are But that also affects the salinity which then affects everything else um, And so if we end up with rising waters that also is the possibility of creating new inlets um, And so as well as getting saltwater intrusion Which is going to change the salinity of our environments Which is also then going to change the plants and animals that inhabit those areas for me. I don't know. I'm not a huge... I don't know how to feel sometimes. But anyway. There they are flagging me in. Fantastic. But I'm going to end things here for our final video here. 
Thank you all so much for watching and following along this journey. There is much more to come, but this part of the adventure is probably coming out of the water. You'll probably get an end of roll credits roll here of me getting the boat out of the water, but I'm gonna end things here. Thank you all so much for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and give it that thumbs up and comment and subscribe. Um, and go back and watch all this other videos if you haven't already yet to see more about this adventure. But thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you out on the water. Well, here we are, I made it. It still feels surreal to me as I'm editing this that I traveled the entire Atlantic ICW. From here, the next big thing is getting started on the documentary that this project set out to do. I've still got some more videos to share with you all over the coming months, so stay tuned. A huge thanks to all the partners of this project, including the Environmental Educators of North Carolina, Ignite Films, Patagonia, Great Outdoor Provisioning Company, Kitty Hawk Kites, Kitty Hawk Surf Company, and the North Carolina Sierra Club. Also to thank you to everyone who donated, housed, and fed me throughout this entire adventure. And thank you to you all so much for following along in this journey, and I hope you got something out of it. Until next time though, I'll catch you out in the water.